Um, I'm glad you shared that with us because a lot of the viewers, a lot of Black Americans, they kind of generalize Africa as one place, but Africa is the most genetically diverse continent in the world. And even in South Africa, I think they have 10 different official languages. They have people from India. They have the Zulus. They have the Nkosa. They have Europeans. They have colored. So in South Africa, you know, people that we would consider black, maybe mixed, maybe like Barack Obama, Halle Berry, Mariah Carey, they're classified as colored. And that was due to apartheid. But it's, a, it's an amazing place. I think that most people, if they visited South Africa, they would enjoy it. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, your experience uh, teaching in Asia? Oh, my goodness. <laughs> I first of all, you know, I'm not a teacher, and so that I'm just gonna be like very transparent and say I struggled uh, doing that. Um, but I was teaching SAT prep also, which is not that interesting on top of it. And I was doing these four hour long classes, so the teaching experience was a little bit of a hot mess. Um, but it was cool to meet the students. Many of the students were attending boarding schools in the United States. Um, and, you know, just building relationships with young people, facing a lot of pressure from their parents, from society, from the culture. Um, the school I was teaching at is a school kids go to after regular school um, called a hagwan or a cram school. So the kids are working really hard over there trying to get these, you know, perfect test scores. Um, and I had just a lot of sympathy for them. Um, they're trying to get where I was. They're trying to go to Harvard, too. Um, the experience living there was amazing, I will say. Um, if anyone gets a chance to go to South Korea, we were right in Seoul, um, right in downtown Seoul, very fashionable. I never felt cute enough to be walking down the streets there. Um, it's like a high fashion, you know, sort of city. So much good food. I think I discovered dumplings as my new favorite food there. I eat dumplings every day. Um, it was good. It was good. The culture was really cool. I think the experience of being there was really good. And I learned that I wasn't going to be a teacher. So, you know, with my interest in education, it helped me clarify um, what my role would be and would not be. And so I came back and went right into, you know, working in admissions um, and just realized that my skill set wasn't going to be, you know, standing in front of a classroom. Wow. Okay. Okay. Thank you for sharing that. Because a lot of times when people hear Korea, um, you know, they probably tend to think of something negative. I haven't been to South Korea, but I have seen pictures and videos of Seoul, and it looks like a world-class city, very technologically advanced and a lot of different things going on. As you mentioned, even with the fashion, you know, that probably wouldn't be at the top of people's list of a place where you think people are really dressy, you know, so hopefully I'll make it out there. Yeah, yeah. they'll love to see you. <laughs> right, right. Okay, now. Now, with all of this world traveling, you back in America, you down south, I want to ask you, how do you feel about being a Black woman in American society today? Oh, that's a, that's a deep question right there. Um, I will say, and this actually stood out to me um, when I was studying abroad um, in South Africa, and one of my families, uh, we stayed in a township and they, uh, they were so impressed. They were so excited about me as a Black woman, you know, who had gone to Harvard and had this ideal that I would be well respected. And they're like, people must respect you. Like, wow, you have achieved all of this. You must be respected. Um, so that was something that I held coming out of that experience. And I was also there during the re-election of George Bush. <laughs> So I have this sort of this high esteem experience. And then I had people sort of conflating me with America. And that was, I think, the first time I identified as being American. I think, you know, growing up in this country, especially as a Black person, you don't think American, you think Black, right? Yeah. Um, and so once you go abroad, I think most people, I'll be curious if you had that experience where all of a sudden people are like, oh, but you're American. And therefore I have some, I have some comments for you and I have some feedback for you, whether or not. And I would, I would so often respond to people, you know, there are 40 million, over 40 million black people in the United States. So it's a larger population than in this country. Um, the, you know, 
there's a diversity of experiences, a diversity of opinions. You know, you can't lump us all together. You can't lump us with Americans, first of all, um, and say we're all the same. And you can't, you know, you can't say all black, black folks are the same. So that's something I've been thinking about ever since then. I thought about it a lot then as sort of this first um, really deep international experience. And so, you know, now that I'm back, um, and, I, and I majored in African-American studies, right? So I sat in class day after day talking about being Black <laughs> and what it means, yeah. what it does not mean. Um, so I'm at a place now where I sort of am acknowledging the shared history that we have. I think that's the most important, that's become one of the most important pieces for me, that regardless of what we got going on today, there's this shared history um, that we have around how our people came to this country, around how people who look like us have been treated um, both in this country and around the world. This sort of membership um, in a larger group of people of color who make up the majority of folks in the world. Sort of how do we want to um, conceptualize our identity in that context? Um, and then what does it mean? And I think each of us as black folks, as a black woman, we have to ask ourselves that question and we have to answer it for ourselves. So. When you ask me the question, how do I feel about being a Black woman in America? First of all, I acknowledge that my experience is unique. The way I'm going to define this is unique and that other folks are free to make a different definition. Um, for me, one thing I've been thinking about a lot, and you probably have heard this, that we're our ancestors' wildest dreams. Um, I love that sentiment and I love that we all have this sort of shared ancestry. Um, and I've been thinking a lot about you know, what my ancestors might have dreamed for me. Um, and how I can sort of fulfill their dreams because they made it possible for me to be here today. Um, one of those things has to do with freedom. And it's one of my foundational values. Wow. I wanna feel free, I wanna be free, I wanna have agency and choice in my life. Um, I wanna work for whom and with whom I want to. And if there's not a for whom, I wanna have that freedom as well. I wanna have the freedom to take rests. Um, I wanna have freedom freedom over my everyday life. And as a Black woman, I feel like, you know, it's my responsibility to lean into that and to make the choice to accept the freedom that my ancestors bought for me. That's how I might, that's how I might answer that as of today. Wow, wow. Well said. I truly appreciate that answer for sure. Um, and, and to speak on what you said, we are our ancestors' wildest dreams. I do a lot of genealogy research for people who don't know. I'll help people retrace their family trees into the 1700s, 1800s, mm -hmm. 1900s. And when I was little, my grandmother, she used to tell me, she said, uh, my father was a follower of Marcus Garvey. He was in the UNIA. And he said that we was Africans and we should go back to Africa and this and that. I thought she was just telling me that to make me feel good. You know what I'm saying? So I'm like, all right, granny. But then I got older and I started doing genealogy and I went to the uh, Case Western Reserve to the archives and I found a membership list. And my, my great grandfather was one of the people that his names was on there and they had his address on there. And my aunt, she's like 70, almost 80. And then I showed her the address and she was like, yeah, yeah, that's him. So I kind of, you know, stuff like that makes me feel better and feel more empowered knowing that I had people before me who were trying to push that same line, you know if you can understand what I'm saying. So. Yeah, for sure. Let me see. I need to do a genealogy study. Oh, yeah, yeah, man. You'd be surprised. You never know who you was related to or what they went through. You know, some great people may have shared the same likes and interests. You know, some things run in the family. Then you'd be like, wow, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, 